Income Tax 2023-2024. Guidelines for Selected Occupations. Get ready and some coffee because tax preparation is like a choose-your-own-adventure novel. Except every choice results in more paperwork. Most of the... First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one. Because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. This information can be found in publication 334, Tax Guide for Small Business for Individuals Who Use Schedule C Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. Noting that the Schedule C rolls into line one income of the formula, which is a little funny because the Schedule C itself is basically an income statement having business income minus business expenses otherwise known as business deductions resulting in in essence net business income rolling into line one of the income tax formula basically laying out the formula on page one of the 1040 we see page one here schedule c ultimately rolling into line number eight additional income from schedule one here is the schedule one Additional income and adjustments to income. Part number one, Schedule C rolling into line three, business income or loss from the Schedule C. This is a Schedule C, profit or loss from business, having an income statement format, income minus expenses. We now want to get into the guidelines for selecting occupations, the section providing information to determine whether your earnings should be reported on Schedule C Form 1040. So we talked a little bit when we looked at the income side of things. If there is income, where do we need to report the income? That is going to be an important question, remembering that for the IRS, everything is basically income unless you say otherwise. That's how the code is generally set up. We're going to assume that things that you are receiving are income unless there's an exception for that particular thing. But then the question is, where do we report the income? Does it make a difference, you might ask? Because if it increases in income, it increases income. And you would, have, you would think that would be an increase to the taxable income, increase to the tax. However, we have seen that sometimes we have more favorable rates for certain types of income, such as lower rates for long-term capital gains and possibly uh, dividend, qualified dividend income. So that's going to be one issue. And if we report things on the Schedule C, we might get the benefit of being allowed to take deductions that we couldn't take otherwise, business deductions. In other words, if we had W-2 income, we're not generally allowed to take expenses related to it. The idea being that the employer is the one that should be dealing with those expenses and therefore we don't get to deduct the expenses. But if it's a Schedule C, we typically do. Plus, if the expenses are greater than the income, we'd have a loss. And losses are actually good for taxes because I might be able to take that loss against some other income. Now, if the income had to be reported somewhere else, such as possibly not on the Schedule C, but rental income, because maybe it was passive income, I still might be able to deduct expenses, but I might be limited in passive loss limitations in terms of how much loss I can take. And uh, if it was reported on the Schedule E, on the plus side, I might not have to be subject to self-employment tax. Remember, that's one of the bad things 
about the Schedule C. If it's on the Schedule C, you're going to be subject to self-employment tax, whereas if it was some other passive income, maybe a Schedule E rental income, maybe it was it was dividends and interest, uh, then might not be subject to self-employment tax. Even if it was W-2 income, you would be subject to payroll taxes, but only the employee portion. So that makes a difference. Now note that we're not typically thinking in this section as to whether you set up another business entity. If you should be reporting on a Schedule C, but then you're like, I'm going to set up an S corporation instead, then you're going to do an S corporation and, and it's going to flow through from the S corporation filed on a separate tax return with a K-1 to the Form 1040. We're basically thinking here, if I didn't do anything else, set up like set up a separate entity, where would my income be? If I just started a hot dog stand, where would that go? Well, you would think that would go on a Schedule C. If I just started making rental property as kind of a passive activity, where you, would you think that would go? You would think possibly that would be on the Schedule E uh, in most cases and so on and so forth. Okay, direct seller. You must report all income you received as a direct seller on Schedule C. This includes any of the following. Income from sales, payments you receive from customers for products they buy from you. So obviously, if you provide products, if you just start selling stuff, you just start selling hot dogs or whatever, then even if it was an illegal business or something, the IRS wants a piece of the business as long as you have revenue on it. And that would typically be reported on the Schedule C, which if you have income is good in that you get to deduct the expenses, but bad in that it will be subject most likely to self-employment tax. Uh, uh, which is employee and employer portion of payroll taxes in essence. So note that you could set up for your hot dog stand or whatever, an S corporation. So that would be a separate legal entity, in which case then you might report it on the S corporation or a partnership or something like that, which would then flow through. But if you just start selling hot dogs, then you would think it would be on the Schedule C. So commissions, bonuses, or percentage you receive for sales and the sales of others who work under you. So again, those are going to be the business items. So we're going to say those are on the Schedule C. So prizes, awards, and gifts you receive from uh, your selling business. So notice these are prizes, awards, and gifts, which you might think, well, those should be like charitable gifts or something like that. But if they're related to your business, then that would be a kind of income. And you can see why that will be important because if the IRS allowed you to say, well, I, I gave them a million dollar uh, award, then people would be receiving awards all the time if they weren't subject to taxes. So you must report this income regardless of whether it is reported to you on an information return. In other words, whether you get a 1099 or not, you should still report it in uh, income. And we talked about this before, just it's important, however, to note the, from the IRS's perspective, it's an information return that we as taxpayers are required to, to report voluntarily, but more and more the IRS is trying to double check, not through audits, but through information returns like the 1099s. So they're, they're trying to get more of the 1099s, which leads us naturally to think as taxpayers that if I don't get a 1099, then I shouldn't be subject to the taxes because that because it seems like the IRS is trying to have everything that should be income reported on a 1099. But that's not the case. We're supposed to have a voluntary uh, reporting system that was used to be judged and, and regulated by audits, random kind of audits rather than all of these information returns. So whether we get a 1099 or not, we should be reporting the income. Certain businesses the IRS doesn't like because they can't really track the 1099s as much, such as cash-based business that do work for customers, such as the hair salons, the restaurants, and so on and so forth. So you are a direct seller if you meet all of the following conditions. Number one, you are engaged in one of the following trades or business. A, selling or solicitating the sale of consumer products either in a home or other place that is not a permanent retail establishment or to any buyer on a buy-sell basis or a deposit commission basis for resale in a home or other place of business that is not a permanent retail establishment. B, 
delivering or distributing newspaper or shopping news, including services directly related to that trade or business. So two, substantially all your pay, whether paid in cash or not, for services described above is directly related to sales or other output, including performance and services, rather than to the number of hours worked. So you're getting paid, obviously, for the goods you're providing, not the hours that you're working typically in this type of business. Three, your services are performed under a written contract between you and the person for whom you perform services and the contract provides that you will not be treated as an employee for federal tax purposes. So we have to draw that line in terms of if you're working for a business, are you a contractor or are you an employee? That needs to be very specific because if you're an employee, you're going to get the W-2 and that's going to affect how you're going to be reporting the income. If you're a contractor, then you would think you'd be reporting it usually on the Schedule C. Next one, executor or administrator. If you administer a deceased person's estate, your fees are reported on Schedule C if you are one of the following. So obviously when someone passes away, someone's going to have to manage their affairs for some time, their assets, their liabilities, and so on, which can be quite time consuming depending on their affairs, depending on their estate. And fees, of course, then would be appropriately charged typically, possibly coming from the estate. And if we're charging fees, then of course, we might have income. The question is, where do we report that income? Possibly on the Schedule C. So number one, a professional fiduciary. Number two, a non-professional fiduciary, personal representative, and both of the following apply. So in other words, we might have a professional fiduciary that is handling the estate, in which case it would be their business. So you would think it would clearly be reported on a Schedule C unless they set up some other entity like an S corporation or something like that. Two, a non-professional fiduciary. So now you have someone that doesn't do this for a living possibly, but is doing it in this case. It's a personal representative and both of the following apply. A, the estate includes an active trade or business in which you actively participate. B, your fees are related to the operation of that trade or business. Number three, a non-professional fiduciary of a single estate that requires extensive managerial activities on your part for a long period of time, provided these activities are enough to be considered a trade or business. So then of course the question is, is this rising to the level basically of a business activity? If you're managing an actual business as part of the process, you would think then you might have the business income. If the estate is large enough that it's basically acting as a business and you're and you're doing substantial services and charging fees for those services, which can quite well be the case, then you might have to report it on the Schedule C, which once again means that you could have expenses against those services, but also have to be reporting possibly the self-employment or being subject to self-employment tax. Okay, we've got the fishing crew member, the good old fishing crew. So if you are a member of a crew that catches fish or other aquatic life, your earnings are reported on Schedule C if you meet all the requirements shown in Chapter 10 under fishing crew member. For whatever reason, fishing crews, kind of like farming, has its own kind a lot of its own kind of rules so if you deal with fishing crews you might be you might have some kind of specialization which can be good because then you can specialize in that area if you don't then you can have to do some research possibly picking up fishing crew clients <laughs> and make sure that you're up to date on it or possibly don't pick up the fishing crew clients or farmers uh, if you're not willing to do the research to make sure that you have what you need to know insurance agent our former uh, termination payments you receive as a former self-employed insurance agent from an insurance company because of services you performed uh, for that company are not reported on Schedule C if all of the following conditions are met. Now, insurance is kind of interesting because when you set up the insurance, you might get paid depending on how the payment structure is as people continue to pay in the insurance. It's kind of like like kind of a pyramid scheme. I'm not trying to call it a scam or anything. I'm just saying you might get paid even after you're not an, an agent. And then the question is, well, if I'm still getting income, but I'm not actually working as an employee for them, 
then do I have to record that income in uh, a Schedule C, which usually wouldn't be good because you wouldn't have any expenses applied to it at that point in time, and it would be subject to self-employment tax. So once again, term termination payments you receive as a former self-employed insurance agent from an insurance company because of services you performed for that company are not reported on Schedule C if the following conditions are met. So uh, you receive payments after your agreement to perform services for the company, uh, services for the company ended. You did not perform any services for the company after your service agreement ended and before the end of the year in which you received the payment. You entered into a covenant not to compete against the company for at least a one year period beginning on the date your service agreement ended. The amount of the payments depended primarily on policies sold by you or credited to your account during the last year of your service agreement or to the extent to which these policies remain in force for some period after your service agreement ended or both. The amount of the payment did not depend on any uh, ex extent on length or service of overall earnings from services performed for the company regardless of whether eligibility for the payments depend on length of service so obviously this is somewhat of a specialized kind of situation this would be something that you'd want to, of course be aware of when making decisions about your employment situations the tax documentation could probably help us from from a tax preparer standpoint in this case because if you were an employee of the insurance company, the insurance company is probably going to do what they need to do to be in compliance, which means they would send you a W-2 if they were required to send you a W-2. And if they're not sending you a W-2 and you had to include it in income, it's likely the insurance company would send you a 1099 in that case, because it's likely that they would be required to do so. Remembering that the fact that you don't get a 1099 does not always mean that you don't have income. You could have income and not get a 1099. But if you did work for like a large company, like an insurance company, then you would think that that if you're a contractor there, they would give you a 1099. So that would give you an indication. You wouldn't get a 1099 if, for example, you did work for like like a, uh, just a customer or something like that, like a hair salon or something, because you're not working for a business and they're not getting a deduction, so they wouldn't send you a 1099. So in any case, somewhat of a special situation. Insurance agent uh, retired. So income paid by an insurance company to a retired self-employed insurance agent based on a percentage of commissions received before retirement is not reported on Schedule C. So we have this sim similar kind of situation where the, the, the whole system, you can see, has kind of been set up as though... Uh, employees should be should be making like salaried or possibly hourly wages but you can imagine in practice people might set up different kind of payment structures such as commission-based payments uh, in an insurance company or in the case of of restaurants tips and whatnot those different payment structures although quite beneficial and totally legitimate from a business standpoint complicate the tax code because the tax code wants to fit everyone into the same box and that's why when you have these different kind of compensations that are more that makes sense they're more creative and they they could they could they could make different business models they often run into kind of issues with regards to the tax code and questions with them the tax code always envisioning one box one kind of system the standard right so also, renewal commissions and deferred commissions for sales made before retirement are generally reported on Schedule C. However, <clears throat> renewal commissions paid to the survivor of an insurance agent are not reported on Schedule C. So again, you would think because this is coming from a, a, bi a big company like an insurance company that they would properly report either the W-2, which you wouldn't be receiving because you're after that point, or a 1099 if they if it was something that was like uh, income that needed to be reported as income. Again, you can't go strictly by a 1099 or not as to whether it's income, but that can help to guide you in that situation. Newspaper carrier or distributor. So you are a direct seller and your earnings are reported on Schedule C if all of the following conditions are applied. 
you are in the business of delivering your distri or distributing newspaper or shopping news, including directly related services such as soliciting customers and collecting receipts. Substantially, all your pay for these services directly relates to your sales or other output rather than the number of hours you work. So now you're selling these newspapers and you're making the money from the sale of the newspapers. That sounds like basically a business. Now, this is an area where it's likely you're not going to get a 1099. Why? Because you sold the newspapers to just people who aren't going to get a deduction for taking the newspaper. So therefore, they're probably they're not going to be 1099 in you and most likely, but you'd still have to report it as income because it is income, right? So, but the 1099 is not going to be a good guide to kind of support whether or not it should be included in income. It's pretty clear in this case that it should be included in income. Uh, and you just need to, it's just a bookkeeping uh, thing now in terms of making sure that you're properly recording it as well as picking up the expenses related to your business. So you perform the services under a written contract that says you will not be treated as an employee for federal tax purposes, meaning you're making the money on the sales, not as fees from the company that's sending you the money, right? So, so now if you're getting the money from the company, like they're collecting the fees and then paying and then paying you, then it's likely that you are going to get a 1099, right? And you, in, the, in that case, you, you're not, you could be seen as an employee or a contractor. If you're a contractor, and you're getting paid by the company who's receiving money from the customers and then paying you, then you would think you would get some type of documentation, a 1099 possibly. So this rule applies whether or not you hire others to help you make deliveries. So it also applies whether you buy the papers from the publisher or are paid based on the number of papers you deliver. So in other words, you can hire someone else, uh, that, then of course you're still gonna be a sole proprietor, you're still a business, because you're making the money. It's just that now that you have an expense, the expense of your employee that you're going to have to pay uh, them. And then the question comes to them as to whether they're an employee W-2 subject to a W-2 or a contractor where you'd have to send them, you would think a 1099. So newspaper or magazine vendor, if you are age 18 or older and you sell newspapers or magazines, your earnings are reported on Schedule C if all of the following conditions apply. You sell newspaper or magazines to ultimate consumers. So once again, newspapers, magazines go into the ultimate consumer, then you're probably not going to get a 1099 if you're getting paid from them directly. But it is, of course, income because you're it's a classic business model. So you sell them at a fixed price. Your earnings are based on the difference between the sales price and your cost of goods sold. So it seems pretty straightforward. They're probably putting this example in place because younger people might be picking this up or people that aren't as familiar with our tax system, immigrants possibly, and therefore, so, and they're more, and they're not gonna get a 1099. So they're more likely to say, I'm not, I'm not sure if I have to report this as income because I'm not getting a 1099, but it is of course a classic 1099 type of business because you're taking in inventory, marking it up and selling it. The reason you're not gonna get a 1099 is because you're selling it to, an end customer and the IRS can't force the customer to give you one because they don't get a deduction for it. So uh, this rule applies whether or not you are uh, guaranteed a minimum amount of earnings. It also applies whether or not you receive credit for unsold newspapers or magazines you return to your supplier. Notary Republic. Fees you receive for services you perform as a notary uh, public are reported on the Schedule C. So these payments are not subject to SE tax. See the instructions for Schedule SE. That is a huge important note uh, to note if you are a notary republic and reporting the fees on the Schedule C. If you cannot be subject to self-employment tax, then of course that would be a benefit. So public official. So public officials generally do not report what they earn for services on uh, public office on Schedule C. These rules apply to payments received by an elected tax collector from the state funds on the basis of a for fixed percent of taxes collected. In other words, most public officials would be on some type of payroll, you would think, and therefore basically get a W-2, but in certain situations, 
uh, possibly they would have they would have a different kind of structure. So public office includes any elective uh, or appointive office of the United States or its territories, the District of Columbia, or a state or its political subdivisions, or a wholly owned instrumentality of any of these. Public officials of state or local governments report their fees from the public on Schedule C if they are paid solely on a fee basis and if their services are eligible. So in other words, you would think many public officials if that's their full-time job, would be getting paid like a salary. But if they're on a fee basis, now they're getting paid possibly by work, time they worked and so on, in which case they might, and they might not be getting a W-2 in that situation. So you would think then Schedule C. This is another area where the documentation would probably be able to guide us most of the, most of the way, because if you're a public official and you were an employee, then you're working for a bureaucratic institution which would give you the proper documentation, either a W-2, which would be clear, or if not, you would think they would still have to give you a 1099 if you're getting paid by the public. It's not a situation where you would get zero documentation, you would think, and that could help us to guide us, you would think, in that situation. So, uh, but not covered by Social Security under the federal state agreement. So once again, public officials of state or local governments report their fees from the public on Schedule C if they are paid solely on a fee basis and if their services are eligible for but not covered by Social Security under a federal state agreement. All right, real estate agent or direct seller. Now, real estate is another one of those areas where you can imagine basically different business models where you have a real estate company hiring people as clients or where they hire people that are still possibly utilizing the resources of a real estate company, but they're hiring people kind of like as contractors. Uh, and then, then usually the IRS tries to be very strict as to whether someone should be a contractor or a W-2 employee, but some of these real estate agents are falling to kind of that gray area as to their qualifications. So this would be another situation where you, you might get questions about from a real estate person as to whether or not they should be or look to be or try to be an employee versus a contractor, what would be the pros and cons of that. But when with just strict tax preparation, then it should be fairly straightforward because if they are an employee and working with a real estate company, they would get a W-2. If not, and they're getting paid through the real estate company, you would think they would get a 1099 form uh, because they are working for a company as opposed to like doing a hair salon or something, getting paid from a customer, in which case you wouldn't get the 1099, right? So if you are a licensed real estate agent or a direct seller, your earnings are reported on Schedule C if both of the following apply. Substantially all uh, your pay for services as a real estate agent or direct seller directly relates to your sales or other output rather than to the number of hours you work. If it was the number of hours you worked, you would think you'd possibly be more likely an employee, in which case you'd receive a W-2. So you perform the services under a written contract that says you will not be treated as an employee for the federal tax purposes. Okay, dealer in section 1256 contracts. So if you are a dealer in uh, options or commodities, your gains and losses from dealing or trading in section 1256 contracts, regulated futures contracts, foreign currency contracts, uh, non-equity options, dealer equity options, and dealer security futures contracts, uh, or property related to those contracts, such as stock used to hedge options, are reported on Schedule C. So for more information there, you can see sections 1256 and 1402i securities or commodities trader so you are a trader in securities or commodities if you are engaged in the business of buying and selling securities or commodities for your own account uh, so as a trader in securities or commodities including if you made section 475f market to market election as a trader in securities or commodities your gain or loss from the disposition of securities or commodities is not reported on schedule c for more information about traders in securities and commodities see publication 550 investment income and expenses 
uh, topic number 429. So in other words, most people aren't in the business of, of like sec of, of securities and commodities trading, you know, right? Because most taxpayers are basically uh, investing in the stock market as more of a passive type of activity, in which case gains and losses are going to be uh, reported, you would think, on a Schedule D, capital gains and losses, typically long-term capital gains and losses at the point in time you uh, sell the stock, and you're going to have income possibly in the form of dividend and interest, which you would think normally would be passive income, possibly reported on the Schedule B or and or on the first page of uh, the Form 1040. But certain people might be in the business of securities and commodities trader, uh, for example, and if it's your actual business, then you might have different reporting standards and requirements. So that's the general idea there.